Hey, First Assembly, this is Pastor Wes. I want to welcome you to Wednesday Word. Hey, listen, so good to be with you again tonight. And man, I want to thank you. I'm so excited uh, about this series that we are in, being faith-driven, not fear-driven. And if you're joining us on Facebook, thank you. And if you would uh, take a second, hit the like button. If you're watching us on YouTube, if you could hit the subscribe button, uh, that would be a blessing to us. And uh, man, please comment, say hello. Let us know you're there, where you're watching from. Uh, we love each week to look and see where people are watching us from, and, and that's a cool thing. And if you have a prayer request, we'd love to hear about it, or a praise report. We'd love to celebrate uh, with you. Uh, we've been walking through a verse or engaging kind of in the topic of a verse that we've all heard. We've all probably quoted it in part or whole, you know, multiple times in our lives. 2 Timothy 1.7 in the New Living Translation says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And some of the translations, instead of self-discipline, say a sound mind. You know, we that, that tend to be an older translation. But I love, I love the translation and prefer the the wording of self-discipline because I think we have a self we have a sound mind when we have a self-disciplined thought process a self-disciplined uh, life not because I'm, I'm enough myself but in those moments I can choose with a sound mind to trust in God and in his word and I think there's a lot of life uh, that boil down to an ability to do that. No matter what's going on, no matter what chaotically is happening, uh, something good or something very challenging, to come to a place mentally and intellectually and in my spirit, trust God and trust in His Word is such a powerful thing. And I think from that comes the maturity that we're all looking for. And the thing is this, we have to control the way that we think. Because if I can control the way that I think, and if I can determine then if I'm going to react or respond, then that is how I will deal and engage with fear in my life. Um, now we know that God says that fear is a spirit. And uh, I'm one that thinks that the enemy will use flesh type things. And, you know, we all have things that we frighten us. Uh, you know, I, people are scared of snakes or spiders or dogs or, you know, normal people are scared of clowns. Uh, those are very normal people uh, like myself. Uh, but I think sometimes those things are used just to normalize the reality of fear, of I don't like something and it frightens me. And he tries to get it to kind of settle into our spirits. You know, fear tries to get into our lives, and what it does is it tries to stop us or cause us to give up on the God assignments of our lives. And we all said this last time we were together, that God has a purpose for our life, and God has given us the gifting and the personality that we need to carry out the assignment that He has for us. And so fear works to stop that from happening. And so understand that faith fights fear. Uh, they both can't really be at the same place at the same time. One's going to win and one is going to lose. Um, and, and so, you know, we can't in life, in, in your everyday. I promise today in your life, you faced or dealt with risk. Uh, you, you can't escape it. You know, if you drove on 95 or 395 or 495, uh, you, you faced risk. If you're married, if you have kids, you know, we risk all the time. And the struggle is this that we wrestle with is, is the risk worth the reward. And then we get caught up in the what ifs. Well, what if this happens? And what if that happens? And 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 we probably have all in some way, shape, or form been at that place where you're you're kind of looking at something and focused on something and all of a sudden, well, what if this happens? And all of a sudden you go down the road and 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 you won't do things, even though it's not really reality yet. So fear tries to get us to give up on the God assignment of our lives. And so when the moments of fear come, we have a moment, we have a decision in that moment to make. Uh, and I want to be clear, none of us can escape those moments, but all of us have a choice in how we choose to respond in those moments, how we're going to respond to it or react to it. And those are different. Reacting and responding are different things, and we're either going to react to a situation or respond to a situation. And we tend to have fear. Um, you know, what, I'm trying to think. You know, you, you face a, a new job. You you you're in a new relationship. Something unexpected comes to your life. There can be anxiousness and worry, and and these things that kind of rise up. But even when it comes to the things of God, we deal with fear because the enemy doesn't want us stepping into these things. 
um, a Sunday or so ago, I challenged people to get involved and serve. Listen, you have personality, you have talents, you have gifts. God's anointed you. Get involved in the body of Christ and use what God has given you and how God has created you to help build the body. Um, and what we know that's the Word of God. God, all through His Word, teaches us that. It's not something we argue with or argue about. We all know that to be true, but a lot of times people don't because of fear. We're fearful about things. And so even in obedience... Even on obedience, I think we still have to deal with emotions, uh, nervousness. You, you, you're, you, you love to teach. You're a gifted teacher, and so you're going to teach a class. But, you know, the first Sunday you walk in, you have nerves, and, and what if no one comes, and what if I blow it, and what if all, you know, we deal with emotions, but in faith, we move forward. And the faithfulness of God is one of those things that has to be experienced and not just talked about. You know, uh, it, it, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to be at a place and to see it and to feel it and to live it and to know that you know that you know that God is faithful. You know, when you have faced fear and found God faithful, it's going to help you next time fear tries to come in and that spirit tries to rise up to say, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you move me because my faith in God is what moves me. You know, the truth is we risk stuff every day. Uh, a couple of Sundays ago, man, I was driving to church and uh, there was an accident that I passed. And I don't know, I don't even know how this guy did this, but the exit by Seminary Road, there's a bridge and the road goes under it. And this car somehow got around the guardrail, drove up under the bridge, hit the base, rolled back down and hit the guardrail, keeping it from going on the road. I don't even know how he got up in there to hit that. Listen, risk is everywhere, but we still live forward. You know, think of all the people in Scripture who had great faith. They were simply people who were willing to say yes and step out and risk for the kingdom in obedience. Um, and, and I think we're all capable of this. Even, even as a young kid, man, I, as a young man, um, I just felt personally very disillusioned um, with life. I can remember asking my mom, is this all life is? Is this it? You know, I get up and I go to school and I come home and do homework and we eat dinner and, and I watch an hour or so of, of TV and then we go to bed and I get up the next day and do the same thing over again. And, and if that's life, I, I just, there's got to be more. Uh, and the truth is, there's more in obedience. Uh, even in obedience, though, we have to overcome fear. Uh, if fear rules your life, you will struggle to step out in faith. And here's why those two are connected. Because fear is a spirit and not just an emotion. Um, listen, I, I have found that people uh, who have the most rules uh, tend to have the most fear. Um, and I can hear people arguing with me already. That's not true, Pastor West. I, I don't know. I just think we sometimes try to legislate things that are really heart dynamics. And we come up with all of these rules, and it's nothing new. It's nothing new. They've done it all through the Old Testament. We come up with rules to try to keep us safe. Um, and, and I think people with the most rules tend to have the most fear. Proverbs 9.10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. You know, we're always dealing with that tension of fear and faith in our lives. You know, we raise our kids so that as they grow, they need us less. Um, you know, you say, oh no, my kids are always, yeah, they are. But seriously, at, at two years old, helping your child tie their shoes is very different than 16 years old, helping your child tie their shoes. We grow our kids to need us less. We grow them to gain an independence from us so that they can function and move forward on their own and in their own because we want them to grow and to develop and to have good, healthy lives. But God, on the other hand, uh, says that maturity in the eyes of God is us growing up and becoming more dependent on Him. Us realizing that I need God more and more and more. Listen, what if God calls us to things that we can't do without Him? What if we feel God stirs your heart to do something and you look and go, I can't do that? Well, alone, no. But with Him, in obedience, in faith, yes, you can. What if he wants us to depend on him? And because he's faithful, we can depend on him. 
uh, the last conversation that Jesus had with the disciples, this is what he told them. Now just take this in. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He's telling the disciples that they're going to go preach to the world and make disciples. And in that moment, Jesus talking to them, it had to feel almost impossible. We're going to do what? We're going to go where? How, you know, Jesus, we've never left this region. We've never left this town. And the truth is, in that day, most people did not travel far from home. And Jesus left them to do what he himself did not do. And he told them this, I'm with you and I have all power. Guys, the devil's going to try to stop you. People are going to try to fight you. They might beat you. They're going to try to kill you. But you don't have to be afraid because I am with you and I have all power. And all power means more than enough and more than enough to bring it to completion. And so if Jesus is in your life tonight as a believer, as a follower of Christ, if Jesus is in your life, then you have all the power that you need to overcome and stand strong in the faith of adversity that tries to come to your life and make you afraid to get you to stop. Now listen, we're not immune to fear. We feel it. I'm not denying that it exists, but what I am saying is we have a choice in what we do with it. You see, most of the time when fear comes and roars, we focus on the fear. We talk it up. We tend to focus on the negativity. We tend to focus on the, the bad what ifs. But because Jesus is with us and he has all power, that should impact how we speak to these things in our lives. I hear people speak in the context of, oh, I just have to get to that place of faith. Well, where you are is a place of faith. Because God has given everyone a measure of faith. And I think it's about becoming aware of the measure of, of faith that I have in the moment that I am in. You know, God's already given you something. And God is the God of the mountain. We all celebrate that, but he's also the God of the valley. I love what God, uh, or what Moses told the people of Israel in Deuteronomy 33, 27. He said, the eternal God is your refuge and his everlasting arms are under you. The Hebrew word for underneath means the bottom. And so it's translated this, and it can mean that God's arms are under you at the bottom, when you feel like you can't get lower, when you feel like the, the, the burden and the weight of whatever you're facing can't push you down any more, that God's arms are underneath of you, holding you. And in Romans 12, we're told that everyone has a measure of faith. Romans 12, 3, because of the privilege and the authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. And so everybody, you and I all, have been given a measure of faith. And there is nothing, there, you got to hear me when I say this, there is nothing that God will require of me or you that he hasn't given you and I the faith to accomplish. You have the measure of faith that you need to be obedient to whatever God is calling you to do. And faith is not just important into our personal walks of God. And here's the thing, we sometimes, oh, I just want to know you, Lord, I, I, I. It's not just about you. Faith isn't just important for your independent, your individual rather, development, but it's important to the body of Christ of which you are a part of as it impacts the body as a whole. You know, Peter, he, he looked at Peter and he said, Peter, Satan has to sift you like wheat. That was personal, but it's also about the future that God had for the New Testament church through the person of Peter whom God was going to use. And so Jesus prayed that Peter's faith would not fail. Listen, the impossible is just impossible until somebody does it. That's it. What feels impossible is impossible until somebody does it. And once someone does it, it's no longer impossible. All it takes is mustard seed faith, someone to become aware of the measure of faith that God has given them, and then step out in obedience in it. And I'm telling you, God has all power, and He is with you even until the end 
of the earth. And you can stare adversity right in the face and know that God has given you the measure of faith you need for this. And so whatever you're facing, whatever you're dealing, whatever feels so big, you have enough faith for it. Okay, it's not an emotion. Fear is not an emotion. Fear is a spirit and we have to face it and fight it in the spirit. And so God has given us the armor of God and he's given you the measure of faith that you need to fight and to overcome whatever you're facing in your lives. And even things that we fear aren't always rational. Uh, there was a study done and it said this, 40% of what we worry about doesn't happen. 30% uh, of things we worry about are in the past and can't be helped. All right, so we're stressing over nothing. There's something, there's something we can't change. It. Twelve percent involves the affairs of others and isn't even our business. So mind your own business. You're stressing about stuff. It's not even your business. Ten percent has to do with sickness or illness or is imagined, and eight percent of things we worry about. Are likely to happen. Uh, in, in 2020, scientists discovered what they called the worry gene and how it may contribute to chronic worry. And listen, we can be tempted to think that this is just a physical thing. That science has said there is a worry gene that can be handed down from parent to child, from parent to child, and that's a physical dynamic. It's never just a physical dynamic. You know, we can't just say, I'm made this way and there's nothing I can do about it. But fear is a spirit and worry is a low-grade fear. You know, think of all of the moments that you have missed. Think of the energy that's been given to things in your life that didn't even happen. These are the little foxes that spoil the vine. Uh, in Mark chapter 5, Jairus comes to Jesus and begs him to come and pray for his daughter who's ill. And Jesus says, okay, I'll go with you. They start headed back to Jairus' house. And while they're on the journey, people from the house come to him and say, listen, your daughter has died. Don't bother the master anymore. But Mark 5 verse 36 says this, but Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Listen, the people who delivered the message were from his house. They had firsthand information. They had trusted information. Jairus, I was there. Jairus, I saw it with my own eyes. Jairus, I felt it in the room. She's dead. She's gone. I'm so sorry. Don't bother Jesus anymore. Jesus. Just come back and let's, let's just plan this funeral. Let's come back and let's mourn. Let's come back and handle this the way we know to handle this. But Jesus, who Jairus has just met, and he's really only ever heard of Jesus and all the things that he could do, was challenged to believe. And Jesus calls him to his measure of faith. Jairus, you can believe their word. Yep, I know what they're saying. I know they just came from the house. But Jarius, I'm saying don't be afraid and just have faith. And so they continue on to the house. And when they arrive at the house, people are doing what you would expect people to be doing uh, when there's been a death. They're weeping. They're upset. They're dealing with the death. They're processing things out. They walk inside. Mark 5, 39 says he went inside and asked why all this commotion and weeping. The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. And Jesus has everyone who laughed and they laughed and they mocked and they ridiculed him. Jesus kicks everybody out of the room, but Peter, James, and John with him. He speaks to the girl. He takes her hand and he raises her up and she lives. See, when we allow worry to have its way in us, the enemy's trying to get us to focus on the problem and fear more than the power of our Savior. And fear and worry work to deceive you by appearance, but things are not always as they seem. And this is why it's so important for us to, re to, to respond rather than react. You see, whatever you do in life, you're going to get better at it. Whatever you do in life, you're going to be more effective in it, more efficient in it. Uh, and that includes worry. When you worry, you're going to get better at worrying. When you worry, you're going to get more efficient at worrying. You're going to find more things to worry about uh, and, and easier at doing it, more gifted in doing it. And, and it's amazing. And worry will lead you to anxiousness, and anxiousness is going to lead you to all sorts of things, and these things continue to build up. But I challenge you to comfort yourself in the Word of God and to combat fear. Faith should make a difference in the way we live. 
Put on the full armor of God, and that includes the shield of faith, which quenches the fiery darts of the enemy, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. These things combat fear, and they give us what we need to release the power of God into every negative situation that we face. So you tonight, and you got to hear me, you are either going to be a warrior or you're going to be a worrier. And what if part of the maturing process is changing our percentage from one to the other? Saying, yeah, things happen. I used to all stress and stress and all, why always me? That never works out for me. And all of a sudden, to where things are happening in my life and saying, I'm not going to bend the knee to fear. I'm going to trust in God and I'm going to trust in his word and watch it. In the past, you said, oh my gosh, but now it's only God. Now it's, I know my Savior has all power and all authority, and He is with me, even to the end of the earth. And I'm going to speak life and truth and walk in faith. You see, everybody can be faithful when it's easy. It's not that hard. It's easy. But when it's tough, when it's challenging, when your life is under attack, when your kids are under attack, when the enemy roars into something that you love, in that moment, are you going to be a worrier? Or are you going to let it drain you of faith and drain you of the ability to see that God is bigger and that God is able? Or are you going to be a warrior and speak life and take up your shield of faith and say, I believe in God and His Word. And I'm not talking about denying things. I'm not talking about ignoring the facts. I'm not talking about just blind foolishness. I am talking about trusting in God in and through it all, though. God will change it or God will walk me through it, but I trust Him. Being a warrior doesn't mean that you don't ever feel afraid. Uh, being a warrior doesn't mean you don't deal with the emotions. Emotions are God-created. They're enemy-manipulated. All right, The uncertainty of what could happen and what might happen. But it is saying what David said. David said in Psalms 56.3, But when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. In 1 Chronicles 11, we're introduced to a man named Benaiah, and he's well known for a lot of things. And in verses 22 to 25, I would encourage you to go through and read them. He was a valiant warrior. He did many heroic deeds. He, scripture says that he killed two champions of Moab. Another time on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and he killed it. Uh, once armed only with a club, he killed an Egyptian warrior who stood seven and a half feet tall, who was armed with a spear as thick as a weaver's beam. He took the spear from the Egyptian and killed him with his own weapon. I love it. it says this that the deeds that these uh, uh, deeds like these made Benaiah as famous as the three mightiest warrior, but he was more honored than all the members of the thirty, though he was not one of the three. And David made him captain of his bodyguard. Why do you think David said this man was honored more than all the other mighty warriors that he had? Because my thoughts are this. David was a lion killer. Uh, David knows what it takes to face a lion and defeat a lion. And that's a small club to be in. And here comes Benaiah, who was also a lion killer. And David said, I know the kind of man that that is. And David wanted him close. There's a certain breed of people who would go into a pit with a lion on a snowy day. There's a certain mindset, there's a certain heart that it takes to fight that kind of fight and that kind of situation. You know, when you hear the Lord speak to you about something, we're filled with faith, we're ready to move mountains, we're ready to run through walls, you know, you leave church, you're all pumped up. But what about when there's snow on the ground? You know, what about when, when it's not a fair playing field? You know, once you're in a pit with a lion, one of you isn't coming out alive. That, that's the truth and the reality of that thing. And sometimes some conditions, and be it snow for Benaiah or a different condition for you, can give us cold feet. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a lion looking for someone to devour. You know, we still need people who are willing to say, God has spoken to me, I'm going to move forward, and if I have to fight a lion in knee-deep snow, then so be it. You know, isn't it only real courage if you're a little scared? We overcome. Faith is easy when it's easy. But when it costs you something, when you feel like you're getting cold feet, faith has to kick in and be the driving force of our lives versus fear because fear will always limit, always steal, always kill, and always destroy. you got to know He's with you. He has all power. And you have all the faith you need for what God is calling you to do. So here's the thing I want you to understand about this battle or spiritual warfare is simply that it's never fair. 
It's never fair. I, I, I'm, I am blown away. I'm blown away sometimes when I see people, God, I just, I'm, I'm just so tired. And then this, why is this happening now? Because it's the devil. Um, he doesn't play fair. The devil doesn't fight fair. Uh, Benaiah, why would you fight a lion on a snowy day or in a pit? It's not to your advantage. Well, let me help you. You don't often choose the timing of the attack. The enemy does, and he's always trying to make it unfair. There's nothing equal about, about a man and a lion fighting. The lion is stronger. The lion has four legs. The man only has two. The lion has every advantage. David versus Goliath, unfair. The giant had every advantage. The armies of, of, of Egypt, you know, the people of Israel, their backs against the sea. They left with the riches of Egypt, not the weapons of Egypt. It was an unfair fight and a slaughter was going to happen. You know, Israel marching around the outside of Jericho, the most fortified city on earth at the time, led by a worship team. Listen, a worship team fighting walls. It's not fair. But here's the thing. My nothingness plus God's almightiness equals giants falling and walls crumbling and sea swallowing, lions dying. So be encouraged. If you are waiting for fairness, I'm telling you, you will quit things that you could have won but didn't because you didn't step out in faith. Sometimes courage moves with cold feet. We've got to step out in faith. Ephesians 6, 3, Therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground after you have done everything to stand. Listen, miracles happen in miracle territory. Psalms 42, 7 says, Deep calls to deep. Deep things happen in deep waters, not puddles. God responds to courage demonstrated in the midst of of fear. Every story, I, I get it, every story doesn't end with a miracle. Sometimes God removes us. Sometimes God takes us from it. And sometimes God simply takes us through things. But I can walk through because he has all power and he is with me. And I have all the faith that I need to be obedient to what God is asking me to do. So calm your hearts with the word of God and go to war with fear. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power of love and of self-discipline. And aren't these the things that you need in battle? Don't you need, when you're in battle, don't you need power? When you're in battle, hey, I want to have the strength to do. God's given you that in faith. Don't you need love? Isn't love one of the greatest? God says the greatest of these is love. It's not just fighting, but it's I know what I fight for. I know where I'm fighting from, and I know who I'm fighting against. Place your love in Him. Self-discipline. I'm going to make mature decisions with my life. I'm going to line up with the Word of God. And if God be for me, who can be against me? All right. It takes courage to face an unfair battle. But faith is our strength. Isaiah 12, 2 says, See, God has come to save me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. The Lord God is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. Isaiah 41, 10. Do not be afraid for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Isaiah 55, 11, So is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God is good. God is good. How do I face fears? Next week, we're going to be looking at Psalms 91, but I encourage you to go ahead and read it. Psalms 91, what a beautiful promise to the people of God. Listen, you have all the faith you need to be obedient to Him. Don't let fear control you. Step in faith, walk in faith, and let's trust the Lord together. First Assembly, I love you and I bless you and I pray you have a great week. And I want to encourage you to tell somebody about Jesus.